Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking about a debate hosted on the channel Slightly Offensive called Christian Conservatives Battle Pro-LGBT Republicans. The conversation is between four conservative thinkers, Lauren Witzke, John Doyle, Carlin Borisenko, and Blair White, and it seeks to explore one question. What is the future of the Conservative Party? Or rather, what should it be? As the description of the video reads, and I kid you not, how do we overcome the woke cancel culture left that has spread through our society like cancer? Do we return to traditional conservative Christian values or create a bigger tent secular party that turns a blind eye to degeneracy and immorality? I honestly have never seen a description for a video that is this cursed in my life, and the video itself is just so much worse. So most of the time, I try to make videos that are, at least to some extent, clever. I have some hot take that I hope is original, and I spend my whole time arguing that that take is good and frankly epic. This, however, is not one of those videos. I don't have something particularly novel to say about this debate, nothing you probably wouldn't have thought about if you saw it yourself, but I'm making it anyway. This conversation was honestly an eye-opener for me. It is so strange, awful, chaotic, and kind of poignant in the worst way imaginable, and for that reason, I just want to talk about it. Bear witness to this surreal moment and share it with you. So that's what's about to happen, and I hope you find something meaningful there. And with that, let's get started. As the name of the video would imply, this debate is broken into two factions. On the Christian conservative side, we have Lauren Witzke and John Doyle. Lauren Witzke, a politician who ran a failed Senate race in Delaware, is about as far right as a person can go. She is staunchly against abortion, gay marriage, trans people, etc. Uh, we also have a transgender on here. Uh, you know, I don't really think we should be giving a platform uh, to this kind of degeneracy, which is a uh, gateway drug to pedophilia. She is for her vision of Christianity, the re-legalization of conversion therapy, the white working class. We could have been going after the working class, the white working class, the Christian working class, uh, the I do agree. Religiously she is also, at least according to the Daily Beast, a flat earther and former QAnon conspiracy theorist. John Doyle is a semi-successful conservative YouTuber sitting at around 300,000 subs. Not as many as me. Think about that. Eat my shit, John Doyle. Within the debate, most of his purpose seems to be agreeing with everything Lauren says to a T. He is also quite a bit more articulate and even-handed than she is. He speaks with a kind of intellectual affect throughout the debate as he describes how he, like the majority of conservative voters, is economically populist and socially authoritarian. If you look at where his voters actually sit on the political spectrum, they're not the right-wing libertarians that a lot of big donors would like the party to be. They're actually basically authoritarian in the center. And so if you look at where they poll on issues such as like gay marriage versus traditional marriage or like transgender bathroom issues, like whatever, they're all like very, uh, I guess you'd say authoritative and, and conservative in that and that they're in support of traditional and socially conservative policies. John Doyle rejects liberalism and embraces full-throated belief in the beauty of natural hierarchy, the enforcement of what he sees as normative Christian values. Because fundamentally the idea of like LGBT issues is about the enshrinement of total equality, which is fundamentally not a conservative idea. Conservatives believe in hierarchy and natural law. In other words, Doyle and Witzke's politics are an explicit function of the bigotry they'd like to see codified in law. That is most of what they represent. On the other side, we have what I'll charitably call the pro-LGBT Republicans, Carlin Borisenko and Blair White. Carlin is, in all senses of the word, a boring grifter. Her claim to fame is a PragerU video that is vapid and meaningless even by PragerU standards. It's about how she was a Democrat who even gave money to Bernie Sanders until she went to a single Donald Trump rally. The MAGA people were nice, unlike the mean Dems, and the rally had so much energy. Whereas the event for the president was full of optimism and enthusiasm, the Democrats event was all doom and gloom. And for these reasons, she now loves Donald Trump. Blair White, our final participant, is 
well, she's Blair White, known conservative trans lady who talks about issues in the trans community. Of course, we will speak about Blair White more. Her interactions with Lauren Witzke are the center of this video, but let's put a pin in her description for just a second. All in all, Borisenko and White represent the moderate liberal conservative perspective. They do not, or are not supposed to, define their politics by way of bigotry. They are fine with the gays. You know, I think a lot of the tension in this debate comes from the aesthetic differences between its actors. The audiences these people are trying to appeal to, and the rhetoric they use to do it. As I said before, John Doyle and Lauren Witzke are pretty transparent about their beliefs. The language Witzke in particular uses throughout this debate is openly hateful and cruel. She makes no attempt to hide her convictions, her hatred of trans people, of gay people, of Donald Trump's Globo Homo initiative. Yeah, so, you know, Donald Trump, he did do things that made the church have to make excuses for him. His Globo Homo initiative uh, ended up losing him a significant amount of the Christian vote. I have a hard time imagining a lot of people being convinced by what she has to say, and that's kind of the point. Witzke is a conservative's conservative, a rallying point, a beacon of anger and bigotry. She doesn't have to be worried about optics. Blair White, on the other hand, is all optics. I hesitated before to describe her politics because to some extent they are hidden within her work. Blair almost exclusively talks about trans people. She doesn't give her perspective on the way the government ought to work, on race, on capitalism, etc., and so it's hard to know exactly where she stands on these issues. I'll say that I, for one, was surprised to learn during this debate that she thinks that Biden most likely stole the election. I'm also one of those people that, I don't know, this might have to be edited out for YouTube, but I'm not completely convinced that the election was won by Biden by completely... Um, legitimate means, so we can say it was um, I think it's just not the sort of thing you'd expect her to say out loud. And even Blair White's videos about trans people are not as explicit as you might expect. Her work can be understood as a kind of collage of anti-trans discourse. One week she'll talk about drag queens reading to children, the next about how the trans community is trying to force people out of their genital preferences, the next she'll talk about children transitioning and detransitioning, the next she'll talk about trans women in sports, the next she'll talk about trans trenders, and so on and so on. Now, all of these issues are certainly deserving of full breakdowns, but here I want to look at the bigger picture. It's been said many times before, but emphasis is the most primary tool of propaganda. Where our gaze is placed, the ideas it is telling us to care about. And in the case of Blair White, that emphasis is always placed exclusively on the pathology of the trans community. It all comes together to say, without ever really saying it, that while trans people are not the disease, a group of people who we must eradicate in some way, they are, as a group, diseased. So, in this conversation then, we have two very different worlds of discourse coming into contact. One surrounds explicit claims, a lack of subtlety, a hammer of conservatism. The other is oriented around the implicit, the unstated, the palatable. And this difference informs so much of how this debate works. So, with that in mind, let's dive in and look at what I think is the most important moment of the debate. Fair warning, what I'm about to show you is kind of long and extremely heavy on the transphobia. How many children saw her and looked at her and said, you know what, she looks really good, I could do that too, and started transitioning? This is about the children. We, they are coming for our kids, and we are at a point now where we're going to have to take a stand. Will the party go the way of the LGBTQ? What Lauren said about children maybe watching my YouTube videos and thinking that they can be like me or transition or whatever. I don't really know how much you know about me, but I'm probably the most vocal anti-children transitioning person on the internet. It's what I'm right. almost, I, it's, well, I, I, let, I let you speak. The best thing you can do for us is I, grow out your mustache 
and tell people not to live like you. That is the best thing that you can do to help us because Christ you are not love. helping. Christ love, wafting off Lauren, Christ love. Yikes, wow. So in this situation, even as Witzke is totally unhinged, abusive, disgusting, and incorrect, the argument she's making is extremely simple, right? It has two steps. Step one, trans people are bad, period. They are very, very bad in a huge number of ways. Step two, we therefore should not tolerate the existence of trans people, and that obviously includes Blair White. In response to this charge, Blair tries to aim at the second step there. She says, wait, I'm not supportive of people being trans. I don't think anybody who watches my content could ever get that message. What Lauren said about children maybe watching my YouTube videos and thinking that they can be like me or transition or whatever. I don't really know how much you know about me, but I'm probably the most vocal anti-children transitioning person on the internet. This is, I think, a pretty bad argument. I'm not trying to say here that Blair White transes any kids, that she makes them be trans. But at the same time, let's not be naive. Pretend that representation doesn't matter. Blair White is a young, attractive, successful, engaged trans woman who tons of young people no doubt look up to. That is important on its face. She implicitly tells her audience in every one of her videos, yes, I am trans, and that's okay. This doesn't mean that Blair White generally makes good points or that she does more good than harm, but yes, she does normalize being trans to some extent, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if some little trans teen from a conservative family watched her videos and felt like they could be themselves without shame. Ultimately, in some sense, Lauren is right. If Blair did detransition, grow out a mustache, and tell her audience that being trans is something that can and should be fixed, it would send a much more hostile, much more anti-trans message than the one she currently sends. That's just a fact. So if the argument that Blair uses here is a bad one, or at least not a particularly strong one, why does she use it? What purpose does it serve? And I think the answer to that is fairly simple. It's a way of avoiding the challenge at hand. The problem with Witzke's claim here lies in its first step. She thinks trans people are bad, and that's not true. Trans people are fine. And to the extent that Blair White does normalize that belief, it's a good thing, actually. But Blair doesn't want to advocate for that position because doing so would make her appear anti-conservative, okay with the trans people. And in fact, Blair seems almost desperate to not be seen as a person who supports trans people on any level. Let's watch some more of that awful clip. As I said earlier, whether anyone on this panel likes it or wants to acknowledge it, there is a really huge chunk of LGBT people who are very much against ideas like children transitioning, like uh, trans women in biological women's sports, um, and all of the ideas that are, you know, hot talking points, but they're very real at the same time. So um, I don't think many kids would look at my YouTube videos and want to do anything like me because I explicitly have been very known for saying that it's not a glamorous lifestyle, that it's difficult, and that children shouldn't be out allowed to transition because it can often be a mistake that really damages their life. So I don't know, I just felt like that was a false premise. And again, I, I would like to agree. What Blair White does here is just incomprehensible weasel language, isn't it? Language that refuses to acknowledge the actual position of the person she's talking to. Lauren Witzke is not interested in some trans moderate position. She is against the franchise of trans people existing, full stop. And Blair just sits there, repeating the points she makes in her videos, trying to convince this woman that they are essentially on the same side. I agree with you about children transitioning, about trans women in sports. I never advertise being trans as something that is fundamentally okay. 
Am I conservative enough for you, Lauren? Have I proven that I am worthy of being a conservative in your world? Blair is not dissenting here. No, she is agreeing with Lauren to the best of her abilities. We can see this same kind of dodgy language happening with the main subject of the debate, on where the conservative party should go. Over and over again, John Doyle and Lauren Witzke say that to them, conservatism means social conservatism. The party against gay marriage, against trans people, against equality. This is why they are conservatives. Carlin argues against this point a bit, at least she sort of starts to. I am straight as an arrow, I'm married to a dude. Between the two of us, I'm the one that's actually married with the family. And so I will say that I absolutely will not vote for a party that treats LGBT people like they are subhuman. I won't do it. But Blair never addresses the substantive issue here, never actually makes a case against having a platform of hatred and oppression. No, she, and for the most part Carlin, just kind of assume that everything these guys want is fine and make one point. If you want to get votes, it's better to not alienate potential voters, better to not be bigoted. I don't think you have to pander. I think you just don't have to try to exclude people. I think that that just loses votes. Um, and so, again, it just goes back to you. You guys can't wield any of this power you say you want to wield if you're not going to win elections. You're just not. And um, I don't know. I just think it's it's just kind of silly to go on about this argument that certain people need to be excluded because all it's doing is telling people not to vote for you. And I also would say, you know, Trump got the most votes of any setting president in history. I think that's true. I think there's a reason for that. I think what I spoke to earlier was the push towards more secularism. And I think that while social conservatives and religious conservatives still voted Trump because it was the right direction, and like you said, they did make a lot of excuses and compromises on their beliefs, um, I think Trump really, and Trumpism is the future of the party and the future of success. You know, minority groups don't necessarily win elections now. Over time, they very well could. Again, this is a really weird argument. As I just said, Witzke and Doyle are conservatives because of the bigotry. A political war fought without social authoritarianism as its aim wouldn't be worth fighting to them. You can say as many times as you want that appealing to gay people would get Republicans more votes, but that would mean appealing to gay people, something they do not want to do. You know, are we going to be the party moving forward? Are we going to be the party that compromises on our values uh, that got us this far? Or are we going to stand firm on issues like family, restoring the nuclear family, getting dads back into the home, uh, re-legalizing conversion therapy, which they have stripped parental rights where children now can't even go to get therapy if they choose to change their mind. In other words, Blair invents an argument about vote-getting tactics, about the way conservatives can get the most power, and in doing so, she gets to avoid a conversation she clearly doesn't want to have. A conversation about if conservatism, at least John Doyle and Lauren Witzke's conservatism, is good. In this debate, then, we can see how a surface-level tension between Blair White and Lauren Witzke betrays a much more real and meaningful sense of consensus. Lauren, with her bluntness and anger and cruelty, says some out-there claim, and Blair, with her evocation and subtlety and bad argumentation, essentially works on her defense. Throughout the conversation, she constantly implies that Lauren is mostly right, that her politics are, at the very least, acceptable. In the moment, this all looks big and conflicted and important, but it doesn't add up to anything. It's not a debate. It's not conservative Christians battling pro-LGBT Republicans. No, it's a focus group. I'd like to end this video with some general claim, say something about conservatives as a whole, how they work, what sorts of discourse they use. But I haven't evidenced any of that, haven't talked about conservatives in general. The only thing we've talked about is this one horrible video, right? And because of that, I'll just leave you here with one humble note. After this conversation, some rando made this tweet. 
This is exactly the look that everybody watching has while having to listen to the two on the other side of the screen. Carlin quickly quote tweeted it, saying, I actually didn't think John Doyle was that bad, except when he went on autopilot and said I quoted a verse about homosexuality when I didn't, but he totally expected that if a liberal quoted the Bible, that's what I'd go for. Other than that, it's okay to be Christian. And Blair replied with this, The difference between John and the other woman is that he simply had a religious worldview. He wasn't disrespectful. She weaponized her religion to hurl personal attacks. She's clearly hurting as a person. I didn't walk away hurt or offended, but sad for her. This is absolutely bonkers, isn't it? The only word I can use to describe it is bonkers. Like, sure, I agree that on some abstract level, it's okay to be a Christian. I'm not trying to convert anybody, and I don't get mad when somebody loves Jesus. That's fine. But this is just a way of muddying the waters, obviously. John Doyle is not just a Christian. He is a Christian authoritarian. He said out loud that he doesn't like the idea of letting gay people be gay privately together because we live in a society and this behavior shouldn't be encouraged. Um, but you seem to be alluding to this idea of like the, the individual in, in their private home and things like that when you talk about, you know, people living in a free society to do what they want and not, you know, causing any problems. But what's interesting about that is that was the argument that during the, the movements in the 1960s and 70s, 70s, including the sexual revolution that allowed a lot of the stuff to have a seat at the table, which ultimately would usurp power away from traditional Americans and traditional social conservatives. And I just think that that's basically a myth because there's really no such thing as a private individual in, in the privacy of their own home because you are one person. And so any actions that you take in your house are ultimately going to reflect you and how you conduct yourself in the real world. Every time he has the chance, he gasses up Lauren Witzke. At least within the confines of this conversation, he endorses her completely. And yet, Lauren is bad because she is cruel and belittling, and Doyle is fine because he says the exact same fucking things in a more polite tone. The very concept of meaningful, principled, ideological disagreement is here thrown so far out the window that it becomes a mockery of itself. Whatever sense of conflict and drama we might feel as we watch the conversation is revealed to be manufactured, incoherent. We don't actually care what you believe, and we never did. It's fine to be Christian. And I don't know, something about that just rings really true for me. Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for watching my video. I know it was a bit dark and I appreciate you sticking with it to the end. If you liked it, like, comment, and subscribe, and feel free to give money to my Patreon if you want to. Of course, I would appreciate it. And now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Anthony Ludwig asks, what is the foundational text of your life? Hmm. Let me, uh, let me tell a little story. I've been thinking about this one. Uh, so when I was in college, we read the book As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. And the professor said, before we really got started, this is a book about the fact that when you have sex, sometimes it leads to children being born. It felt like wizardry to me to just be so attentive to these basic foundational parts of a text that they completely change your reading and you can explore them with this just wild imagination. Uh, so I guess the foundational text of my life is that professor saying, that sentence, that as I lay dying is about how when you have sex, children sometimes are born. Love that. Uh, okay, bye. Hope that answer, uh, hope, hope someone enjoyed that answer.